morning, everyone. Good morning. I greet you. I welcome you in the name of Jesus. I just, I'm, I'm pumped to be here today. I just, I love you guys so much. Seriously. I've lost count. I, it's probably been at least five, six, seven years I've been invited either to be part of the Easter or the Palm Sunday service here. And it's, it's like a tradition for me. And I just, I love you. And I thank you for asking me. Because, you know, what better day to spend with family? You guys are family to me. Because I can come out here and I can be the wild man that I really am. <laughs> and just share with you the deep feelings of my heart. And you accept me. Which makes it all the cooler. So, you know, I... I have some thoughts I want to share, and I've got all these scribbles. I got up early this morning, scribbled some new notes, so I we'll just see what comes out. Friday night, I don't know why I did it. Well, I do, I do. I, I watched The Passion of the Christ, okay? Passion of the Christ. That's a movie I, I don't watch with other people. Because I cry. I cry through it. And I start yelling at the TV. What's wrong with you guys? And I then I and I said I see what's going on and and I just I I start praying, Lord, I would pray with you in Gethsemane. I want to be that man. When you need me, I want to be there. That you can count on me, Lord. And then I think, well, look at all the times I failed him. And then I start getting sad, but then I start coming back and say, no. My beloved Lord Jesus, I'm committed to you. I want to pray with you in Gethsemane. I want to be that man you can count on. And then when I see what he did, you know, he, he was beat up severely before he even got to the flogging. And then I start <coughs> wanting to turn away. I, I want to turn away and not look at it anymore. It hurts me to see what he endured. And, and I wrestled with this because then I realized, I said, okay, he was the son of God regardless. But now consider this. Jesus could have lived to be a hundred years old. He could have been an old gray-haired man who <coughs> died and still break that ver barrier between heaven and earth. He was the Son of God. That even if he lived to 100 years old and died an old man, had been content, he still would have broken that barrier where we could have gone back. But then there was the covenant part. The reason why he had to spill his blood. And that's the part I just marvel at. And this actually starts back in Exodus 19 with Moses. Okay, remember? Mount Sinai, he's going up, Moses is going up to Mount Sinai, and, he, and the Lord tells him, tell my people this. If you obey my commandments, do everything that you do, everything that I ask of you. Obey my commandments, do everything I ask you, then you will be my treasured possession. Though the whole world is mine, you will be you know, the holy nation, royal priesthood. Okay? The Sinai covenant. Okay? It's a huge covenant. Though the whole world is mine, you're going to be my treasured possession. So when you read Exodus, Moses is going back and forth from Sinai, back to the people. who go up and say, yeah, Father, this is, they said they'll do it. Then Moses comes down and gives them the law. Goes back and says, yeah, they're going to do it. Comes back and then he writes it all down. And Moses says, okay, guys, this is it. Are you really going to make this covenant? Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll do. We're going to do everything that God asks of us. And Moses writes, writes it all down, and he reads it to the people. Okay, here it is. This is everything that God has asked of you. And the people said, yes, we will obey. <laughs> then Moses slaughtered a bull and took the blood and sprinkled it over all the people. The covenant was established by blood. 
So here's Jesus <coughs> establishing His new covenant, His greater covenant, by blood. It had to be because that's how the first covenant was established. So here's Jesus establishing the second greater covenant. Now, if you want to write this down, it's Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 34. It's the greater covenant, the new covenant. And if you want to learn more about it, read Hebrews chapters 8 through 10. Hebrews chapter 8 through 10, he explains, the writer explains how far superior it is this covenant that Jesus makes to the first one at Sinai. Okay? Now this is it. I will put my law on their hearts and write it on their minds. I will be their God and they'll be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or brother know the Lord because you will all know me. I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. That's the greater covenant of Jesus. That's the covenant that he established with his blood. And when you hear the prayer over the wine, it makes reference to the blood of the new covenant. Okay? That's why Jesus did it. That's why he shared, he shed his blood. Now let's take this next step. Now Jesus, realistically, to establish the covenant, after he was beaten up and bleeding. He shed blood. After he was whipped and flogged, he had shed even more blood. But Jesus took this to the ultimate extent. That when you watch the movie and read, read the Gospels, Jesus didn't just spill some of his blood to establish the covenant. He gave it all. Okay? Because remember, at the end, when the uh, Roman soldier stabbed him with the spear, there was no more blood left in him. Water came out. And this is something you need to know about Jesus. He doesn't just give you a portion. He doesn't just, you know, follow the law of tithing, well, I'll give you 10% of what I have. That's not Jesus. He doesn't say, I'm just going to give you 10%. He's in it 100%. Everything. Everything. Now this was a prophetic word that he gave me in my last blessing. He says, all of what I have is yours. And it shows how gregarious and how loving. Just It shows his way of thinking. He does not want to hold back anything from you. That when he told me, all I have is yours, I'm sharing this with you, because it's the, it's the same promise to you. I am teaching you the promise that he made to you. All that I have is yours. And he demonstrated it by sharing every drop of his blood. He spilt it, he gave it all. He laid it all out. He didn't hold back anything. And I kept thinking, man, how could you not love this guy? Everything. Now when you think about it in life, when Jesus says, all I have is yours, what all does he have? And then I've shared this testimony with people and they'd actually ask me, look at me like, well, what all does Jesus have? I said, well, everything. And then their eyes glaze over like, what? They, they don't understand. What all does he have? Everything. Okay. Then I have to start quoting scripture, Haggai 2, where, where the Lord says, all the silver and gold is mine. All of it. If Jesus wants you to have a billion dollars, you'll have a billion dollars. Okay? But see, we just think in terms of material blessings, when the greater blessing is when you realize that when Jesus says, all I have is yours, think about wisdom. You know, I met a man that had a, had a vision where he saw God. And he didn't see all of God. He saw one aspect of God. He saw 
the holiness of God. And he marveled at it. The depth and breadth of holiness, where he couldn't fathom God being anything grander than holy. And that for all eternity, he, he realized you could study holiness, just holiness, and never, ever, ever comprehend or experience the fullness of God as holy. And then the scene changed. And now we've seen the purity of God. And again, his mind was, was baffled that God is pure, and for all eternity, you can explore purity and never, ever, ever experience or let alone comprehend the fullness of the purity of God. And then the scene changed again to love. And you see the progression here. That for all eternity, you could experience you can, you can never even comprehend or experience the fullness of one little aspect, let alone wisdom, faith, joy, love, hope, patience, all of these attributes. And Jesus says, all that I have is yours, <coughs> which means you have access everything. Now think of it this way. <coughs> when you pray for faith, some people think that I'm praying for God to take a little piece of faith and put it in me. Or pray for help. He's going to take just this little, little, little piece and all it takes, you know, God, he's, I mean, bigger than we can imagine and just has to take just a little piece and just put it in you and that's, that's all you need. That's not how it works. Okay? This is a revelation. This is a mystery that you need to understand. When you pray for faith, what's really happening is God is opening the door for you to tap into His faith. So what you're really doing, you have access to all faith. Overwhelming faith. Unending faith. So when you're tapping in these attributes from God, what you're really doing is opening the spigot to an unending flow. Or in other words, you're tapping into the faith of Jesus. Now think about this. When Jesus says, I will do this, do you think he has faith that he can do it? Of course. Because he has all authority in heaven and earth. When Jesus says, I'm going to do it, ain't nobody big enough to stop him. And he's true to his word. So when he says, all I have is yours, it boggles my mind. Because he showed what this really meant when he spilled every drop of his blood. He did it to show the extent of this covenant that he's making with you. I will forgive your sins and I will remember them no more. Wow! That's redemption beyond, beyond my mind's ability to comprehend. But then the access for all eternity to everything that Jesus has. How can you not love a guy like that? <coughs> How could you not be willing to give up everything? Because that was the next question he asked. All that I have is yours. Now, what are you willing to give up for everything? That's the hard one. That's the hard one, isn't it? What are you willing to give up? Because we're so used to, man, you know, I got this stack of bills here. I know I got to get this paid. I got this job. I got these responsibilities. I got all these people that count on me. I gotta, I gotta do this. I gotta go out and fight and forage and scratch and claw. And I'm just gonna fight and I'm gonna win and I'm gonna just not back down and. Huh? He gave me the answer because I wasn't really sure at first. All that I have is yours. What are you willing to give up for everything? And the answer. Control. 
that I have to be willing to give control of my life over to him. Why not? He's the one that said, I know the plans I have for you. Jeremiah 29. I know the plans that I have for you. Which meant, now, now, I, I want you to hear this for a second, okay? That God first created the work, okay? In every age of man, there was a work to do, okay? You know, from the Garden of Eden clear to the end, that every age there was a specific work that had to be done in that age, which the next age built on, which the next age after that built on, that every age of man built on the work that was done before, okay? That there was a purpose and a place and a plan for everything. That God created the work first, and then he created you to fulfill a very specific role at the specific age that he placed you in. Think about it. You could have been created any time. You, know, you could have lived in the 1800s, the 1600s, the 1500s. You could have been a slave in Egypt. You know, you could have lived in any age of man. But God created you for such a time as this. So there was a work that God had in mind that he created you to fulfill. He wired you, he gifted you, all your life's experiences helped prepare you for the work that he has for you to accomplish now. For such a time as this. And then Jesus says, all I have is yours. That you might fulfill plan I have for you. And the answer for me, I had to be willing to give up control and to trust him. Okay? That's the hard part. That's the hard part. Now, I got some great stuff here, but I'm running out of time. Just go. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, okay, 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 okay. okay. I, I gotta get I gotta get to the Easter story. You know, Jesus told him everything that was going to happen. He laid it all out. Now, here's, here's a verse. I want you to remember this. John 12, 30. John chapter 12, verse 30. Jesus is telling him everything that's going to happen. Lay it all out. And then he prays, and all the disciples hear the auto voice of God respond to Jesus. I mean, talk about a second witness. That was huge. Okay? So Jesus is telling him, hey, I'm going to be crucified. You know, I'm going to come back in three days. You know, I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this. Prepare you. I'm telling you this. And they hear the auto voice of God speak to Jesus. And this is what Jesus said to him. He goes, okay, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. It's like, Folks, disciples, you needed to hear this. Because what I'm telling you is true. So, here Jesus says, I'm going to do this. They hear the other voice of God, but it still didn't register. They still didn't get it. They didn't understand. It was so far out of their realm of understanding. Oh, you're, you're going to die. Oh, okay, well, no, because I believe that you're going to be the Messiah and kick the Romans out. Yeah, you tell me this, but I still believe you're going to do this. You see what I mean? That was a big, you know, it was a short circuit that they were having. That Jesus is telling them, hey, wait a minute, this is what I'm doing, this is my work. But they said, but I don't want to accept you that way. I don't accept you this way. And that's why when he died, their whole world was turned upside down. They couldn't cope with it. I mean, their whole lives were ruined. The disciples on the road to Emmaus. I love this story. You know, I, I preached on this story, and I, I kept, I wanted, I wanted to believe. Oh yeah, here their whole worlds are upside down, and here's these two disciples, two of the seventy. Okay. Oh man, we gotta love them seventy. These two seventy, they're still going out to minister. Ah oh, yeah, oh yeah, I, they, they gotta be. They're seventy. They wouldn't give up. But seriously, when you read the story, that's not the case. These guys had given up. 
And what's more significant, when you read the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, especially the Luke version, okay? Now this is what's so overwhelming. The Luke version. We're told that one of them was named Cleopas. Cleopas. Remember that name, okay? Now out of all scriptures, as far as I remember, only three of the 70 are named. Matthias, who ended up taking Judas's place. Stephen, the first one that was stoned, you know, the first Christian martyr, and Cleopas. Now, I was reading this book, if I recall, it was the History of Church by Eusebius. It was written in like 200 AD, you know, the history of the church. And he started talking about Cleopas. This is significant. Cleopas was Mary's older brother. Okay? Mary, mother of Jesus. Cleopas. One of the 70 was her older brother. He knew Jesus his whole life. He saw the signs and wonders. He knew of you know, Gabriel's visitation. He saw the miracles and everything. And he was one of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And here they are, he and his Cleopas and his buddy, they're walking down this road, and all of a sudden Jesus is walking next to them. And they're all down, they're dejected, they're just... Oh, my whole life is ruined. Oh, he died. What's going to happen to us? And Jesus walking next to him said, Hey, guys, what happened? And they looked at him like, What? You must be a stranger. You don't know what happened? And Jesus, oh, he was just messing with them. He was messing with them. It was, Really? What happened? <laughs> and they start telling Jesus about Jesus. And I can just imagine what Jesus is thinking. But you guys, come on. You know me. You know me. Pay attention. They start telling them all about Jesus. And here's this prophet and he died and all. And finally Jesus pretty much has enough of it. And he says to them, he goes, Oh foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. He chastised them. Come on guys. Don't be foolish. Pay attention. I warned you about it. I told you what was going to happen. I told you all of this. How'd you forget? Evening came. They sat down and Jesus took bread and broke it. Blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And that's when the scales were removed from their eyes and they saw. And immediately Jesus vanished. Now this is what's so unique. Is that one, Cleopas knew Jesus his whole life. He should have recognized him right off. But for some reason, the spirit, the demonic spirit of confusion and doubt overwhelmed him. And that's what it was. It was a demonic attack. He was so focused on the struggles, the pain, and he was just, he was getting immersed and sucked into depression where he couldn't even see Jesus next to him. And it shows how easy it is for us to get so caught up with confusion and doubt that we can't see Jesus by our side. But here was the solution right here. Here's the solution that rescued those two disciples. It was the bread. It was an element of deliverance. Deliverance. Spiritual deliverance remove the scales, to actually banish the demonic presence that are attacking you, that's keeping you from seeing. And they were able to see him. And then they started realizing, did not our hearts burn within us as he walked with us along the way? Then it started coming back to him. Hey, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. I felt the Holy Spirit. How did we not recognize it? Well, you were so caught up with doubt. You were so caught up with confusion that you're wallowing in these things, that you forgot to pay attention to the signs and wonders. You were, you were so caught up with your pain, your anger, your doubt, that you didn't feel the Holy Spirit burning within you. Well, you did, but you didn't recognize it. Jesus is by your side. You're so caught up with the problems, you didn't see all the help that was available to you. That's the most important lesson here with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's a lesson for each and every one of us. These are scary times that we're in. 
I mean, the world's topsy-turvy. You watch the news and you think, what's wrong with these people? How could you do these things? And it's so easy to get caught up with the problems of debt, work, unemployment, food, sickness. That there is so much darkness pressing in that the confusion and doubt, it's easy to find yourself in a place where you no longer feel Jesus who has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. That's the resurrection promise. I am with you always. Not sometimes, not weekends and holidays, I am with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That many times people look for Jesus, we look for these huge miracles. You know, we don't see these big miracles. Well, why are you leaving me alone? And forget that Jesus is always in the small things, the mundane, the daily life. That he is with us always. And all the signs are there, the burning the bosom, the testimonies, the scriptures. The communion. So I'm sharing this with you. That let this be a day of deliverance. Here is the bread and here is the wine. This is a day of deliverance for you. That this will be a day that you will know beyond any shadow of doubt that whatever happens, Jesus has got this. That whatever you go through, Jesus is bigger than anything you'll ever face. And in some ways, Jesus is saying, hey, I know there's some issues here, but let's take care of it together. Even more, if you give it to me, watch what I can do, do for you. What are you willing to give up for unending, unfathomable help? This is what took the disciples to finally come to their senses. To realize all the help that they had available. So I'm sharing this with you. It's the invitation. I mean, this is your resurrection day. When you resurrect into, when you can resurrect yourself into a whole new being. A being of vast potential. Of abounding hope. Of excitement beyond compare. Nothing is too big for Jesus to handle. He wants you to give it to him. He wants you to trust him. He wants to say, hey, what's this? And then astound you. So, I've done what I can to prepare you. Today's a new beginning. And it starts when you kneel and remember the oath that you're making with these prayers. That you take this bread and this wine, remembering Him. And that you are promising God that you will always remember Jesus to keep His commandments that He's given to you, that you may always have His Spirit to be with you. That's His promise. And as he spoke it, it will be done. Happy Easter. I love you. Thank you so much. Amen. God is so good. Amen. 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 Just as I testify to you, just as Steve got up to begin talking, the Spirit impressed me to share Scripture with you. And I opened the book and started kind of reading it. And what he touched upon in his sermon this morning, every bit of it, is with what I'm about to share with you. You have just cleansed your spirit. 
and you are now empty vessels. You are to receive the Word of God, and let this be your Resurrection Sunday. Let this be what changes from here on. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, and the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. There's a harvest coming. You're part of it. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, with my great army, which I will send among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dwelt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall <coughs> prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible of the day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Would you stand, please? Heavenly Father, this day, this congregation, these vessels of righteousness stand before you and offer up to you the emptiness of their soul for you to fill. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for those virtues and characteristics and the love that you have, the, the duties, the responsibilities, that which you have called them to do. Fill them, O oh Lord, that they may be full and overflowing, abundance, and may it pour out to each that they come in contact with. May it be imbued with the light and the love of your Holy Spirit, May it move out and change the world into which they journey. Heavenly Father, seal upon these your children this new covenant and make within them a voice of hope and joy for that kingdom which surely exists and that doubt is, is shadowing from us. Dispel the doubt. Make us overflowing in courage and love and outreach. Commission us each to become 70s for you. To move out in strength and in love for this your final harvest. The children that are here, O oh Lord, continue to encourage them and, and surround them with angels that the presence of your Spirit may teach them in their experience from their youngest years how to see the kingdom and to move in it. <clears throat> that there may be a generation who can cross the Jordan into the Promised Land. So, Heavenly Father, we seal your love and your spirit upon these here, 
in the name of Jesus Christ, our Deliverer. Amen.